Marshall John Fisher. He's the author and co-author of five previous books, including two, The Invention of Television, which he wrote with his father, uh, A Terrible Splendor, Three Extraordinary Men, A World Poised for War, and The Greatest Tennis Match Ever Played, which won the inaugural PENESPN <laughs> Literary Sports Writing, and A Backhanded Gift, a novel. His work has appeared in The Atlantic, Harper's, and Best American Essays in 17, and, oh, Miami, 1972, and NFL's only perfect season, Christian Tracy's The Art of the Ragtag Bunch of Without further ado, Michelle Hall. Thank you, Jose. Very different. Marshall and I, by the way, one little thing Jose didn't know, a little secret here. We both went to high school together. Good. Yes, and we have, I'm just going to ask, how many Killian Cougars are in the room? Okay, yes. So um, anyway, Marshall was two years old. You're class of 81, right? Yep. Class of 81, I was class of 83. Um, so we went to high school together, Killian High, and um, I grew up here as well. And so in 1972, I was seven. Um, I was born in 65, so I was seven years old. And you know, those were the days, if you were down here, you'll remember things like the Cranham Park Zoo. You know, things that newer people don't know. How many people remember the Cranham Park Zoo? Remember the train that went around the zoo? Yeah, there, I mean, Cranham Park was not just the beach. There was a zoo with zoo animals, with tigers and lions and elephants and whatever, um, and, and, you know, uh, amusement rides, huh? One tiger. One tiger, <laughs> one tiger, but it's more than they have now. It's more tigers than they have now. So anyway, it was just, it was a different time. You know, there was bird eyes, there was a Cranham Park Zoo, the Skipper Chuck Show. All of us that were kids remember the Skipper Chuck Show. Uh, Jay Byron's, you know, stores that don't exist anymore, Jordan Marsh. Yeah. Anyway, so it was a different time. And in sports, as you will learn from Marshall and in this book, um, sports were very different. The Miami Dolphins professional football, uh, Dave, my husband, just interviewed uh, Larry Zonka this morning. And Larry Zonka, who was like the greatest player at that time, pretty much, he held out for $60,000. He held out a training camp for $60,000 which now, as they point out, which is true, college kids now who have done nothing are getting NIL deals for $100,000. They've never done anything. So the sports landscape has totally changed. The Miami landscape has completely changed. And, and that is what Marshall wrote about in, in this wonderful book. Um, so I'm just gonna get going with some questions and let you take it from there, and then we'll, we'll take some questions at the end. Um, so first of all, how did you come to write the book? Why, I mean, you're obviously, I give you a, you're a historian, but you also love sports, and you, you know, you've written sports history books. What, what is it about this you know, I, topic? I had always intended to write this book. You know, having, I was nine years old during that perfect season, 72, and um, I just think it had a huge impact on everyone here, especially on kids who were growing up and uh, who were just getting, becoming fans with the greatest team ever. You know, it's really the first season that I was ever with a, a real fan of a team was, year of the, you know, the greatest season ever played. So it had a huge effect and I, I just always kind of thought I would write about it. I remember in college, I was in a, a creative writing workshop and uh, the, the, the teacher had told me, I, I was trying to get into the creative writing program and he said, well, you know, you're, you're a pretty good writer, but but uh, you don't seem to have a real passion for it like some of the other people. You know, I was a physics major then. I was. He went to Brandeis University. By the way, I, I know that there's any, one Brandeis at least, right? Really? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Brandeis. Okay. Anyway, so I, I, you know, he, he actually did, was, was not going to let me into the program because he didn't think I was committed enough. And so I, to show him, I went back, you know, and tried to write the, really the best story I could write. And it was called 17 and 0. And it was a short story about a high school senior in 1972 in Miami, in, you know, kind of living through this perfect season. And that, and I sent, I turned that in and, and he admitted me into the program and he said, okay. I you know, you're really into this. So that's not a coincidence, you know, because I think that the team had such an effect on the people who were living there. So I always intended, as I went through my writing career, I always knew I would write, I wanted to write a book about that season. I kind of thought about it on the 30th anniversary and the 40th, but 
finally got around to <laughs> writing a project in time to get it done for the 50th anniversary. And tell us about the research. Who did you talk to? How did you go about doing the research? I mean, it's 50 years later, so what yeah. are some of the things you did to get all of this information that's in here? There's well, a lot of footnotes in the back. Yeah, I began just by reading. You know, I read everything. I read all, you know, Miami Herald and the Miami News for the whole year, you know, from before the preseason through the Super Bowl. A lot of magazine articles, as much background as I could. And then, of course, I tried to, I interviewed, I ended up interviewing about 10 players. Uh, you know, they're probably, of the 40, I think there were 40, uh, just the 40 man roster then. So I think about half of them were around and, and able, but I, I was able to interview about 10 of them. Some, were, some didn't want to talk to me, which is fine, I understood. Uh, you know, but I was really happy to get to reach 10 of them, and they were great. 10 great interviews, and, uh, and, and some other people, like Larry King, who was, um, you know, he started his career in Miami, and he was the color man for WIOD for golfing games in, I, maybe, I don't know about 69, but 70, yeah, I think 69, 70, 71. He was not during 72, because he ran into some legal trouble at the end of the 71 season, and uh, was let go by WIOD and, uh, and the TV station he was working for, I think Channel 4. Um, so, but he was still a huge fan that year, and he still had a show on another station, and he's still a big part of it. So he was great to talk to. And, uh, you know, that was it. I just read everything I could find and talked to anyone I could find that I, I could uh, remember. <laughs> what surprised you? Uh, you know, you obviously were a fan. You did all this reading. You knew all this information. What are some things that surprised you as you were doing the research that really jumped out? Yeah, a few things. Um, well, I was surprised, you know, I wanted to write about not just the football and not just the football season, but also about Miami at that time and the country. And, you know, the, and 72 was an important year in a lot of ways. And, and Miami was a focal point for a lot of that. And uh, but I was surprised uh, at the level of, of still of segregation. I mean, not legal segregation, but uh, it was still a time when in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, black players were not really happy when they got traded to Miami. Uh, it was not a great place. Be a black player. Um, it was hard for them to find places to live. There were some areas where they really were not welcome, even even as professional football players. Um, although they were all eventually very happy they had been traded here because they got to play for the greatest coach and the greatest team, and it was, a, I mean, to a man, they were all very happy afterwards. But I was interested. I was interested to learn what Miami was like back then, and there were some surprises there. Um, and then, um, can you give us some examples? Give us a. Some details, what were some of the, you know, that was a good detail about the, the you know, even the players couldn't find housing. What were some yeah. of the things that were segregated? I was, I was, I didn't know, I saw on page 26, that Don Shula really integrated the team and he, like he had Afro picks placed in the locker room, which was something sort of to welcome black players. Yeah. You know, can you talk about a couple yeah. of some of those details? Well, it's funny, you know, when Mercury Morris came down and he was drafted in 69 and he came down and saw a completely segregated locker room Blacks dressed on one side, the whites on the other, and they even shower, they stayed on separate sides of the shower. And he tried, well, he, when he was down here for the rookie camp, he made a big effort of trying to mix everyone up and integrate it, but even he didn't do that once the veterans came back. I mean, he, you know, he was a rookie, and uh, so that kind of, that situation stayed. And Mark Fleming made a point about it when he came down in 1970, but it was really Don Shula who stepped in and. You know, and Morris told me, um, he didn't think Shula did this because he was such a great liberal and wanted to, you know, do the right thing and have an integrated team. He wanted to win. And, and he knew to have a winning team, they had to be work together as a team. So he immediately integrated the locker room, moved all the lockers around so it was all mixed, and he uh, assigned roommates, both in training camp and um, for road games, and they were all mixed as much as he could. Um, so he really did, a, made a huge difference, and I think it, it did help the team uh, because they really, this was a group of players, all kinds of different people at a, at a time, and, you know, of course we're pretty divided now, but in the early 70s it was, it was a very fractious time with the Vietnam War going on, which I talked about some. Um, and there were, you know, that Miami team was as, divide, as mixed as uh, the, the, our whole society was. You had the kind of the crew cut conservative types like the quarterbacks, Bob Greasy and Earl Morrill and a few other guys, you know. I mean, Earl Morrill always looked like it was 1958. Yeah, they were <laughs> exactly the same. And then you had the guys with the long beef chop sideburns and the long mustaches and bell bottoms, Jim Mandich and Manny Fernandez, as he was reading from the, from the intro there. Um, 
And so they were very politically different and, and socially different, but they all really melded together as a team, which I think is one of the, one of the remarkable things about that. Um, you, you're, you're mentioning here about you know just bringing in, not just sports, but bringing in society, what was going on in society, what was going on you know, with everything from the war to Watergate and Nixon, and you talk quite a bit about Nixon. Um, there was this one little anecdote that I loved um, you know, Nixon was a big, he played football. He played in college and he was a big fan. And uh, so this is just this one little paragraph I'm gonna read. The year before, after the Dolphins had won the AFC Championship game, Don Shula received a phone call at 1.30 a.m. Fortunately, he was not asleep as he was watching a network rebroadcast of the game. He was stunned to hear that it was the White House and that he should please hold for the president. This is 1.30 in the morning, okay? Then came the singular Nixon voice over the line. Coach Shula, I want to personally congratulate you on the great effort that your team displayed today in winning the championship. They talked for a few minutes about the game and about the challenge of taking on the Cowboys in the Super Bowl. Then after a thoughtful pause, Coach, I think it would be a good idea for you to use a pass that you throw to Warfield. <laughs> what pass, sir? You know that slant-in pattern where Warfield starts down and then breaks into the middle of the field. This play was one Greasy and Warfield used often and to great effect. As Mike Freeman later wrote, this was like suggesting to Mick Jagger that he sings Satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. President, we do plan on using that slant-in pattern to Warfield against the Cowboys. And then Nixon said, I think it could work for a big game. <laughs> yes, sir, it can. So anyway, um, if you could talk a little bit about the politics at that time, both political conventions went, were going on in Miami Beach. If you, you talked about that in the book. Um, talk a little about that for those yeah, who are not here. Yeah, uh, and I, I do think you need to work on your Nixon impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> a little <laughs> deeper, yeah. But um, you know, one of the great things about this story that I you know, aside from the football team, is that Miami really was a focal point that year. And, and Nixon, I mean, both conventions were held in Miami for the last, last time they were held in the same city. And Watergate uh, investigation was getting going and the Vietnam War was still raging. And, uh, and Nixon was down here a lot and he was staying, you know, where he had his winter White House. So Miami really fit in that, to, to the whole national scene that year. And uh, I enjoyed writing about Nixon and, and comparing him to Shula because he, I think it was, I think he liked Shula a lot more than vice versa. Of a, <laughs> I mean, he, he kind of saw himself in Shula uh, in the sense that uh, they both had been risen to the very top of their profession at one point without being able to go all the way. Nixon, you know, had, had been a political superstar. I mean, he, you know, he was a senator and then vice president for eight years. And then, but then he lost the 1960 election, lost the, the gubernatorial election in 62. And that's when he told the press, you know, you don't want to have Nixon to kick around anymore. And, Supposedly he disappeared, but uh, at that point he was kind of like Shula uh, after uh, losing Super Bowl six to the Cowboys, where he'd lost, he'd now lost uh, two Super Bowls and also an NFL championship. Uh, so he was known as the greatest coach in football, but still never won the big one. And that's when uh, he, he wrote to Shula a couple times and called him that time. Uh, he kind of saw Shula in himself, um, and of course they both ended up winning the big one. But, uh, but Nixon was quite a character, and, and I, you know, I, I found him somewhat. I'm never, I'm never a big Nixon fan, but I found him something of a sympathetic character in, uh, in, in the sense that he, 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 he really was not well liked, but he had enormous drive and really pushed himself to the top. Why did you decide, and just about blending together the societal stuff with the sports stuff? What, what was it about that that fascinated you so much? Well, I think it was just wanting to tell the whole story of, of what was going on, you know, and not just the you know, just talk about football games. Um, although there's a lot about the games in there too. <laughs> but it was just such an interesting time, and uh, in Miami, as I say, it was just you know, it just happens that the greatest season ever, the greatest football season ever, was in a place where it was really a place that reflected the, what was going on in the nation and all these interesting things going on. And how did the team bring? Do you think that the team brought people together? Was this team? Well, a unifier at a time where there was so much Yeah, pressure. that's what people say. And it's certainly, the thing about this team is they had people, I mean, they had Nixon man on the team, you know, got the kind of people like Bonacani was, he was actually a Democrat, but there was a large group in the country called Democrats for Nixon. I mean, Nixon was so much more popular than McGovern in this election that a whole large group of Democrats went for Nixon. And Bonacani was kind of in that group, and he, and Twilley, Howard Twilley was a real Republican, and uh, 
and there were a lot of the conservative guys, and there were a lot of very liberal guys like uh, you know Marlon Briscoe, Mark Fleming worked for McGovern and uh, Paul Warfield, um, um, Buck Swift, who was you know another of these great stories on this team. He played for Little Amherst College near where I live now in Western Mass. So the great little liberal, liberal arts college, not a football powerhouse, Division Three, but um, somehow he got a chance to try out for the Dolphins. I mean, he certainly wasn't drafted, uh, but he was a great athlete. He came down here and got the job and was the starting linebacker for six years. But I brought him up because he was like the closest thing to a hippie on the Dolphin team. He was a real, real left wing kind of guy from this left wing college. And but you know, so they would they would argue a little bit in the locker room. But I think largely because of Shula. They were really had were really focused, and their team was more important to them than getting into spats about about politics. And they all said that to a man that um, you know they were so focused, and that's Shula because Shula was so in, intensely focused on winning, and uh, he was able to communicate that to all of his players, especially after losing that Super Bowl. And uh, so it was a remarkable, a remarkable situation of a very diverse group coming together and working so well together toward a, one one goal. Some people have said that you know this was maybe one of the smartest teams, that the brains on the team were, yes, they had great athletes, obviously, um, but what they did was also because of the cerebral part. The people, can you just talk about the brains and just yeah. from the people that you've interviewed and the research you did, where these guys went on, what they went on to become, and, and just how intelligent were these people? Well, that's one of the things I kind of vaguely remembered about the team, that they were a really smart group of guys. I wonder if was that really true and so I, when I went back to research, uh, I found that actually it was largely true. I mean, not, not, not everyone, but you know, they, they became lawyers, uh, Buck Swift became a doctor, um, a lot of successful businessmen. They really, they really were a bright group and, uh, and I think that had a lot to do, a lot to do with their sex, but uh, they were very funny. I mean, guys like Sanka and Mercury Morris, Andy Fernandez, I mean, they're, they're, they were very funny people to interview at the time. You know, they had a lot of really great quotes, and you know, they were witty, which is a you know, form of intelligence. They were a very bright group, and they had a very complex playbook on offense and defense, which they had to follow, and they did really well. I have to say, at 35 years of sports writing, we cannot say that that's true of a lot of the people that we cover. So that, would have been, that sounds like that would have been a really, really fun team. You know, one of the questions was what was unique about this group of players. So you kind of just covered that. Um, George Wilson joked that he had basically said that he already had the core of this great team in place by 69, and any Joe Dotes could have won the Super Bowl with this team. Um, what are your thoughts on that comment? You did say that. Um, it's not totally. I mean, it's false that anyone could have won with this team. Shula did an amazing job. It is true that a lot of the components were in place. Uh, about half of the these great players that we all know, about half of them were already there by 69. And it really wasn't that bad a team. You know, they, for an expansion team, which began in 1966, they really weren't that bad. They won three games the first year, then four games, then five games. You know, they were, for an expansion team, that's not bad. And uh, they probably would have continued that rise in 69 uh, except they had a, a, just a slew of injuries uh, that year. It was just awful, and they 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 fell to uh, I think they won three games again. But you know, at one point they were one and six, and Larry King wrote he had a column in the um, in the Herald of the News. I, I can't remember. He had a newspaper column, and he I remember he wrote in it, uh, "Has there ever been a better one in sixteen than this team?" And, <laughs> and he was right. Like, they had a lot of talent. Now I don't think they would have gone all the way probably with George Wilson. Back. I mean, he was sort of—he was kind of at the end of his career. He had won an NFL championship with Detroit in the '50s, but I think he saw this job as sort of a springboard to retirement. But he was very easy with them. But Shula came in, and there were a bunch of new players also in 1970 with Shula. They had an amazing draft, and and brought in people like Paul Warfield, Mark Fleming, and five great players in the draft. So it was a lot of different people too, and uh, you know, and Shula was a, a remarkable. Motivator of people, uh, I mean, above all else, and he really got them to work and, and accomplish what they did. What are your memories? We haven't talked about that. You were a nine year old. What do nine. you personally remember about that season? Well, my main memory, or my biggest memory, is uh, going to the one game. I mean, we used to go to about one game a year, and uh, my dad took my brother and me to game five in the Orange Bowl against San Diego. And unfortunately, my clearest memory of that day is Doc Greasy being rolled off the field in a stretcher. 
that's the game he uh, dislocated his ankle. And I remember that feeling of just disappointment uh, around the whole stadium. It was, it was let down because, you know, they, they were 4 0 and uh, hoping to, you know, have, have a great season. Now they lost their, you know, probably their MVP in Bob Green. But luckily, as said, uh, you know, Earl Morrill, Shula brought in Earl Morrill just that year. Oh, I guess this was interesting. And, um, you know, Morrill had been his backup. Shula's back up in, in Baltimore and had done the same thing in 1968 when Johnny Unitas was out all year and took them all the way to an NFL championship, but they then lost the Super Bowl. Uh, and then but he came right in and did the same thing. So I remember that game very clearly, of course. And uh, also, I really remember Super Bowl Sunday. The thing, the thing that stands out in my mind about anything on Super Bowl Sunday is when the moment of victory, when we start hearing all these horns going off. I'm like, what is that? We ran out in the front yard and the horn, everyone was honking their horns all over the, the neighborhood. Um, what about the atmosphere of the games? The parking, you know, those of us who went to the Orange Bowl, the no blocky, no blocky, everyone used to park. You know, that was really, and, and that's what I really miss about the Orange Bowl. And, you know, no offense to anyone who's involved with Hard Rock Stadium, but to me, that's just a generic antiseptic stadium out in the middle of nowhere with a big parking lot around it. And, you know, one day it can be the Dolphins game, the next day it's a tennis tournament, the next day it's an F1 race course. Um, you know, the Orange Bowl was just a cauldron of sports energy for the Dolphins and for UM. And, and you would go to a game there and it was part of the community because the, the stadium was in the urban core of the community. And so people actually lived there and you parked in their yards and right, you got to know, up. everyone had signs, you got to know the people whose houses you parked at. And, there were people cooking in the yards and you're eating, you know, in the streets. And it, it was just such a great, you know, kind of like Wrigley Field in Chicago or something where, you know, it's a stadium, it's in the urban core. And, and I really feel all that was lost when they moved. And also, the, by the way, the sports teams like University of Miami was never good again after they left the Orange Bowl. <laughs> so there, there really was something magical about that building. Um, what, what, what are you recalling from yeah. your research about the Orange Bowl? Tell us a little about the Orange Bowl and what that meant to their success. You know, the Orange Bowl was a huge, Huge home field advantage, you know, not for the Dolphins and for the Hurricanes. They each had huge, long, long streets, the undefeated streets at, at home, over lasting several years. And Zago talked about, uh, you know, how when they drive into the closed end of the stadium and everyone would be screaming, it would just feel like a giant heartbeat you know, pounding. And, uh, and he was talking today, today about how they, they, the players would park in the parking lot with everybody else, and they'd walk out and they'd hang out with the fans and tailgate with them. Shows what a different area it was. Yeah, he was saying today, Larry Zonka, that, um, and, and I, I, when I wrote that story about the Orange Bowl, too, the players did not have their own parking lot. The players just had a parking pass, but it was a pass to go into the main parking lot where all the fans were. So Larry Zonka would park, and Bob Greasy would park right next to a fan. And they would get to know the fans. And the other thing was that I learned from that story that, um, that Jose was quoted is um, that they used to have a Saturday morning walkthrough. The Dolphins would have a walkthrough practice every Saturday morning at 11 a.m. or so at the Orange Bowl, and Don Shula left the gates open, and the neighborhood kids would come and watch practice. I mean, this is something that would never, in a million years, the athletes now are so segregated from the fans. You, a sports fan now can barely ever get near an athlete. And back then, Don Shula left the gates open as competitive as he was and as intense as he was. The kids from the neighborhood would come and hang out at the practice, and then after the practice, the players would throw catch and play catch with local kids. And then those kids would show up at the game, and, and Larry Zonka said today, the kids would wait at the gate. They couldn't get in. They were poorer kids from the neighborhood. Larry Zonka and all the other players would just tell the security guys, oh, these are my kids, this is my family, and they would just bring the kids into the games. So those were just yeah, such different there, times. Along the same lines, you, you watch you know, films of these old games around this time, and the game ends, and everyone jumps onto the field, and like Don Shula's going onto the field, and people are patting him on the back, <laughs> and fans are everywhere, mixing with all the players, and you know. It was just, you know, it was better then. <laughs> Let's just say better, right? Come on. Sports, sports was just better when the, when the stars made $60,000, and the kids could go watch the practice, and the players parked next to the. Oh, well, 60000 back then. <laughs> Like right, that's about good. half a million today, but which is it was a nice salary. But uh, on the other hand, half a million today is less than the minimum NFL salary. Yeah, absolutely. 
So I know you guys have questions because I know a lot of you are probably, I see by the, uh, by the wardrobe and attire in this room <laughs> that there definitely are some diehard Dolphin fans here. Um, so we'll open it up for questions. Um, what do you guys want to know from Marshall? He's done a lot of research. This is a really fantastic book. You need to buy it, have him sign it. It's a great holiday gift. Um, what questions do you guys have? People, like Michelle just said, a lot of these players had jobs in the offseason. And I know one of them, Dick Anderson, became what he is, you know, where he came with the insurance uh, business that he had. But what other jobs did, did you uh, encounter that some of these players had? I think, uh, I remember Manny Fernandez uh, was a substitute teacher, and uh, some guys were you know, working carpentry jobs in the offseason. You know, it's funny, I mean, Jim Kick, even after winning the Super Bowl, in seven, after the 72 season, he was interviewed. <laughs> That summer, he's saying how his wife keeps nagging to go out and get a job. And he just, <laughs> <laughs> and he just wanted to go play basketball with his friends. And you know, that's after winning a Super Bowl. So I, I don't think he did get a job. Uh, but <laughs> you know, just the thought that uh, you would even consider having a job work quite a different story. What did you uh, well, I went, I went up north for college, and uh, I came back. I was here for a little bit, but um, I don't know. I always wanted to live in New York City, and I went there for a while, and then moved to Boston, and then lived in Boston for 10 years, and now we've been in uh, the Berkshires for 20, over 20 years. So it's just life. <laughs> it wasn't a specific decision to, to leave, but. Lisa, Killian Cougar. Yes, yeah, Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to say, some of the things that football players did in this uh, time was they modeled clothing oh, yeah. for, my, for my family's business. Which, oh. which is? Surrey. Surrey, oh, so, yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, so Larry, we have pictures of Larry yeah. and Jim Kick, Paul Warfield. Like, in, you know, there's some like modeling picks, and then there's like candid, and it's just that's great. Yeah, Surrey's natural. What you're talking about that you know with the segregation, it was Paul. It was always that group, like with Paul Warfield too, and um, you know that was just uh, you know that was like a very cool thing. You know, yeah, it was Surrey's ads were all over the paper. It's about the Yankees as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Over there. Now. Yes. I, I, I was just shocked. Uh, so when I knew I was coming here, I watched last night NFL film, the perfect season. I was blown away by in their division, the players, who they had to go against. I mean, O.J. Simpson in his prime, and Jim Plunkett, and Joe Namath, and Johnny Yu. I mean, I was, I was blown away by that. Uh, did, I mean, it's easy to say, oh, 16 and 0, and where was the competition? But I mean, and they had to go on the road for the AFC yeah. Championship. Uh, do you address that in the book? And then the last question, what I really have, do you address when they all went to the World Football League? Yeah, a little bit. Um, well, yeah, so a lot of people have said uh, that, that teams had an easy schedule that year, but it didn't look that way at the time, you know, uh, especially the first part. They had the first, three of the first four games were on the road against very tough teams. And then, you know, as you mentioned, in the division, there were, I mean, the Jets were, were good. They would have been, I mean, they, they were supposed to be uh, uh, definitely a playoff team. And Baltimore, in fact, was, was picked by many to go to the Super Bowl. So, you know, a lot of it was that the, those teams, they had to play the Dolphins, each had to play the Dolphins twice. You know, Dolphins, I think the Jets ended up, uh, I can't remember, eight, six maybe. Uh, but, you know, they, if, they, if the Dolphins weren't so great, they would have had a better record. Same thing with Baltimore. So a lot of the the poor record that their opponents had it partly had to do with them. Uh, and partly had to do with some teams just, you know, weren't as good as they'd been expected. But uh, certainly the first half of the season was very tough. Uh, the other thing you asked was about the World Football League. Yeah, sure, I talk about that. I mean, that's kind of what killed uh, Eddie Sintel's dynasty, you know, after the after the 70, after two straight Super Bowl wins, uh, Kick, Warfield, and Zonka announced they were leaving for the World Football League, which is a new, a new rival league. Even though they were gonna, they played the 74 season with the Dolphins, but had already signed for the 75 season. So that whole 74 year was sort of under this cloud of their three great players leaving. They still had a very good season and should have gone further in the playoffs than they did. They had that, Extraordinarily painful loss to the Raiders, the, the sea of hands cast that ended, ended the Dolphins dynasty, and then those players were gone. And uh, several key players got very injured the next year as well, so that really was the end of it. And Larry Zonka said today, by the way, that you know, his one regret maybe was leaving the Dolphins. 
that if he could do anything over, he would have stayed and kept playing for sure. You might say that. But well, he's sorry. But he's, I don't think he regretted the million dollars he got. No, he's saying <laughs> it. He said if he could do it again, I think he, what he meant is he, he would have taken that million, and then but when the NGWFL failed, he after one year, he would have come back to Miami. Come back to Miami. All right. Good. Good point. Yes. Yes. How did Mad, uh, Mad Dog Manage get his name? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Mad Dog. How did he get that name? Mad Dog Manage. Oh, he's just kind of a wild character. He showed up. In 1970, you know, with bell bottoms and jewelry and kind of a wild lifestyle, and uh, I, you know, I think it was just his off the field lifestyle, probably not, not so much on the field. I mean, he was he was a he was a good tight end, but Mad Dog must have. I think I think that must have referred to as some late night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. Dave, um, can you talk a little bit about the famous uh, gallery across the past? <laughs> 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 Well, that's the only funny thing about that. Well, that's the play everyone remembers from, or, or not Dolphin fans, but around the country, the play people remember is Gary Premier lining up for a 42 yard field goal to make it 17 0 to ice a 17 0 season, which would have been just too perfect. But of course, it got blocked. He tried to throw, he went straight up. Wrong hand, he used his left hand. He used his right, he's left. Oh, that's right, he used the wrong But I think, and I, I wondered about that, but actually, I think he, he threw right. I think he kicked lefty and threw right. All right. Yeah, I, I always thought, yeah, he threw with the wrong hand, but, but I, I, I'll mention this again in a minute because he, he ball went straight up and then it came down and he had a second chance to just fall down. And he batted it up like a volleyball. And finally, Mike Bass of the Redskins grabbed it and went the other way. And that was 14 7, and it was a little tense at the end there. Um, but the, the most interesting thing to me about that is that it happened two months before that. Just two months before, they were playing the Cardinals in the Monday night game in the Orange Bowl. And he did the same thing. He kicked the ball, it got blocked. He tried to throw it, also righty, because I think he did throw righty. But the same thing, the ball went straight up, came down, and at that time, everyone just jumped on it, you know, and that was the end of it. So it wasn't, it wasn't, didn't hurt them as much. But what, I'm, I'm, what really surprised me after I noticed that is that Don Shula, who's the master of detail, attention to detail, you know, everything to get the winning edge, and he, after that game, he didn't have Caro just practice kicking ball to ball 15 minutes a day. That's, that's the kind of thing that Shula would have done, is make him do that every day of practice. And I guess he didn't do it, because two months later it happened again. And it was not sure that's the Super Bowl. Yeah. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about Don Shula and what made him such a great coach? Yeah, he had an incredible, uh, he was just an immensely motivated to succeed. Uh, much, you know, he grew up fairly poor in Ohio and, you know, worked, he would always, always had to work as a kid and, you know, it was, it was kind of a tough life. And then, but he was a great athlete and he played football for John Carroll University, a small school, but then somehow got noticed by Paul Brown, got drafted by the Browns, his, his team that he loved. So, you know, that was a dream come true. But he always, I think, wanted to be a coach. And he was just uh, always organized in the whole game. Even when he was not organized, always interested in the entire game and organizing everything. Even when he was a player in the NFL, people said he was like a coach on the field, he paid attention to everything. And uh, the great thing I think about him was that he was able to, to motivate other people with his own, his own mania for winning, especially after losing the Super Bowl to Dallas after uh, the 71 season. He was just became obsessed with getting back and winning it because he, you know, he had to win a Super Bowl. He, he got every player to buy in on that. I mean, Ferndon Heard told me that on the flight home from that Super Bowl, he went up, he was walking up and down the aisle, talking to every player. They remember this. Remember how you feel right now. Because next year we're gonna, you know, so make sure you're never gonna feel this way again. And that was his mantra. He, and uh, in uh, the first day of practice, he was showing reels of, of the Super Bowl. And <laughs> he was just someone obsessed with winning and success and able to create that you know, yeah. Yes. Um, since your very first or early experience with football and with the Dolphins was that they won everything, has your life since then been a disappointment? <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Scott, uh, <laughs> to some extent, probably as a fan, sure. Uh, the funny thing, though, the, the effect on me of, of growing up with that, or having been introduced to football with, in those years with that team, is that even in later years when I really didn't care, didn't really have a team. I mean, I'm living up there, but I really wasn't following any particular team. Certainly not the Patriots. 
when I was just when I didn't watch football, I was always interested in a, in a uh, team that ran the ball and controlled the clock, right? It's all just a, that style of play somehow got. I just love to see that, and I, I, I guess it's just nostalgia for for those years. I love uh, ground control football. Yeah. Let me kind of take it back to that one. Let's say this new team, right? It's full and healthy next year. They're seven and zero with two of them this year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you foresee this new team healthy? Doing a run at the at the Seattle <laughs> Dolphins? Well, you know they they have the most exciting team they've had in a long time. Mm -hmm. right? It's been a long time since I think they had a team that was as much fun to watch as they the one now. I mean, they're really a great team to watch now with Tua and the wide receivers and they and everything really. So they have a, they've had a lot of injuries. This and, year. The and the coach. And the coach. Yeah, yeah. Smart, yeah. Big coach. difference. Yeah, definitely. They're really fun to watch this year. They, uh, undefeated though, I, I don't know. I just don't know if anyone can do that again. There's just so many. There are more games. There's more parity. There's just, I'm not sure that'll ever happen again. But. Uh, yeah, I, uh, well, actually, two comments and a question. Uh, first, you know, what you were saying about the Orange Bowl, I was talking to somebody, I was at the Zonka uh, presentation, and I was telling them that I went to the Eagle game, I'm trying to remember what year it was, it was a Monday night game against Jaworski and the Eagles, and we were on the 20, and the noise, you always, you always remember the noise, Jaworski couldn't get a snap on it. And there was no way any stadium can duplicate what those old stadiums did because I remember everybody just pounding their feet, pounding their feet, and that stadium shaking, literally shaking. So um, that, yeah. that's a memory I have. Absolutely, yeah, they talked about that. I mean, and there was a game in 72, I think it was Namath was kept, kept coming in and he couldn't call the play. He called you know, time, they used to do that, you know, they'd like call for time. And, and Fonacani was screaming at him across the line of scrimmage. Run the happy play. <laughs> 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 I mean, he did. 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 He did.